All right. Now, this series is going to be on the Jesus Built Life. But you notice I got up there the Jesus Built Church. And inside your book, the first page talks about the Jesus uh, Built Church model. And so if you turn in there, you'll find it. That there's a diagram that looks something like that. And uh, it's actually missing, the, yours is missing something. There's some blanks on the wheel. And uh, you're going to be able to start filling those in. But the, the Jesus Built Church model, uh, after several years of uh, you know, going to conferences and you know, is, uh, all, all sorts of models in order to grow your church. And uh, the purpose-driven church model, uh, you know, there's a charismatic church model. There's a bunch of models out there. And I, I felt like, why don't we just go back to the Jesus? He said, I will build my church and the Jesus Built model. And so after studying for some while, uh, I've come up with these three great principles that Jesus teaches us. And the first one is uh, the Great Confession. I think the church is built on the Great Confession. We're going to look at that in a few moments. But for right now, it's just simply this. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is at the heart and the core of our church. That's at the heart and the core uh, of our faith. A confession that you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we're going to explore that in a lot more detail this evening. All right. Now the second principle that uh, guides the, the Jesus built church. So the great commandment, and the great commandment was given by the Lord. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the other guiding principle that guides a Jesus-built church. The next one is the Great Commission. And Jesus, uh, after he was resurrected from the dead, he was told, he said, all authority has been given me. And with all the authority in heaven and earth, he could have said anything that would have been done. This is what he says. Go and make disciples of all nations. This is pretty important stuff. He wants us not to hang on to our faith, but he wants us to spread our faith. Okay? And so this, uh, I was hoping a friend of mine was going to be here tonight. He's another pastor. Uh, we've been working on this Jesus Church, uh, the Built Church model uh, together, and he's doing it at his church. And uh, he's the one that gave me the idea that this is cyclical. It goes around and around. You see, how it works is, uh, when I came to Christ, I made the Great Confession. I then, as I went to church, started learning more about the Great Commandment. As I performed the Great Commandment, it led me to want to share my faith with other people. And so I, I would share my faith with someone else so that they would make the Great Confession. And then around and around it goes. And when, when this model is working, the church grows. The church grows. And so it's not about... I don't think it's about a lot of techniques, and I don't think it's about uh, the best music in town. I don't think, there's so many things. It's not about. It's about getting back to scriptural, biblical principle. And so we're going to deal with this whole idea, moving from the, the Jesus-built church to the Jesus-built life. Because the church, in the early church, they had no buildings. Now think about that for a moment. There was no church building. They met in homes. They met at the temple court. They met at previously existing. So one thing I had, they didn't have a church debt. <laughs> they didn't have a janitor or maintenance. They, I mean, everything that came in went back into ministry. It's just the way it is. That's a beautiful part of our church. Our church now is paid off so that we don't, everything that comes in at this point can go into actual ministry in people's lives. And, and that's really important. But I want to talk about the Jesus Built Church was not about a building. The Jesus Built Church is about people. Focusing all of our attention on people. And uh, you are the people that I'm talking about here. We are the church. All right. Now, I want to start working on this Jesus Built Life concept. And as we do, I want to see that in the book of Acts, when there are no church buildings, in the book of Acts, we're going to start... Because Jesus has already established these principles in the gospel. As we pick up in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost takes place. Peter has been preaching, and I believe that he's preaching about the great confession. 
believe Jesus Christ is the uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that's what he's preaching because it says those who accepted his message. He's preaching those who accepted his message. All right. They were, what was the question is, what is the message? Well, you have to go to previous verses, and it says that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's preaching to them that Jesus is the Lord, that is God, that Jesus is the Christ, okay, the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, and this is the core of his preaching and his teaching. And on the day of Pentecost, when, he, when the Holy Spirit came, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and we're out preaching... Those who accepted his message, this message, and that's the whole idea. We want to share, we want to live our lives in such a way that people ask for the reason of hope that's in us. So that we can turn around and share the message of who Jesus is. And by doing that, we'll be pointing them to Jesus, uh, the Lord, the Christ. All right? Now, those who accepted his message, they got baptized. Now, baptism is like a ring, the wedding ring. When a couple gets married, they put on the ring to show as a public sign that they have made a commitment to one another uh, to love each other for life. Baptism is like that of my conversion. That I believe that Jesus is the Christ, and so to tell the whole world that, I get baptized. And so it says here, now you'll notice in your little diagram, you're missing the arrow, so you got to draw your arrows then, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, you got to do some work here. Right? So you got, you got to draw the arrow. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number. Now, I'm not going to take the time to demonstrate, but between this passage, Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, we know that this is the day the church was born. Uh, not Bethany, but yes, Bethany. Bethany was born. Because the church is that body of people who know Jesus. We know Jesus, so we're part of that church. We're just in a different time span, but we are the church, okay? And here's what happens. The great the People make the great confession, get baptized, they join a church. It's in the church then that they grow in their faith. This is the model that we have, I think, right here in the very, very beginning of the church. It's built on the Great Confession. Secondly, in the book of Acts, it's built on the Great Commandment. Now, as time goes on, we're going we're gonna to zero in on this Great Commandment tonight. And in the Great Commandment, I'm suggesting it teaches us to love the Lord, your God, and you do that through worship. And we'll be discussing that even more so next week. We'll, we'll be looking at... How, how worship is the way I show the lo my love to the Lord. Now, they devoted themselves to, and I think they, this group of believers, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And, and that's why, I put a Bible in everybody's thing. Okay. That's why this book is so important. All right? This is the apostles' teaching. You know the New Testament? We build it on the apostles' teaching. That's what's at the core of our church ministry here is we worship through listening to the voice of God through the sacred scriptures. That's part of our worship. And fellowship. Now, fellowship is part of our worship, too, because we're fellowshipping with the other parts of the member of the body of Christ. We're all part of that. The breaking of bread. And they broke bread. Uh, I think this is a reference to actually celebrating the Lord's Supper. It goes on and says, and a prayer. Uh, we need to be a praying church. And to a certain degree, we are, okay? But in, in almost every area of our lives, I think even the church, our church, can become a better praying church. Anybody agree with that? We can become a, a, a better praying church? Yeah. You know, this last summer, I told you about this, that we, um, we had asked, I'd asked the, the deacons, let's pray that God would bring people who don't know Jesus into our church so that they come to know Jesus. And we prayed for, I don't know, maybe through the summer, and, and then... Uh, Shana came one Sunday to the service. None of us knew her. And at the close of the service, she said, I want to become a Christian. Okay? You know, of course, now she was here this morning. Uh, but she got baptized a couple weeks ago. All right? I think that's a direct answer to our prayers. And so later, I'm going to talk, you know, the third week of what we're doing here, I want to talk about prayer outreach. How I believe we can grow our church through praying. Okay? 
through praying. So, uh, everyone was filled with awe. Because this is, wow. <laughs> wow. I'm hoping we come to the point where our church has what I call the wow factor. When people leave here, they say, wow. God showed up today. Here's how we were showing up then. They were filled with awe because many wonders, miraculous signs were done. There's three terms here. A wonder, which means a marvel or awe. Miracle means power. And sign means God was giving a special revelation from heaven. A true miracle is different from just an answer to prayer. Okay? I pray for something and God does it, and that's an answer to prayer. Many people call that a miracle, and it can be miraculous. And, but not in the full biblical sense of the ter term. Uh, a miracle is when God does something extraordinary in the way he operates his universe in order to give a specific message. And everybody stands in awe and goes, wow. Okay? Now, when Jesus did his miracles, okay, and the apostles did the miracles, but when Jesus did his miracles, it always got a response. There's always a response. You can never stand neutral with Jesus. The people either went, wow, or they picked up stones to stone him. You see, you can't stand neutral. You're either for him or against him. There's no lukewarm in that area. Anyway, they were filled with awe of the, what's going on in, in the church at that day. And every day they continued to meet together. This is so important. Not too long ago, a person said to me, well, I can worship God anywhere. And Now, is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can. Yeah. <laughs> but they continue to meet. They continue to meet. Hebrew says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Okay? Which is the way some people did. Did you get a booklet? This one right oh, here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they met together. The church, when you're a genuine Christian, you search out other believers. It's just part of your makeup. Because you become part of the family of God. And you want to hang out with other members of the family of God. So they were meeting together in the temple courts because they had no church buildings. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There was something really cool going on in their midst. They were, they were coming together in unity and being one accord. And the final thing here says they were praising God. I think all of this, this whole thing, is they were fulfilling that second aspect. They made the great confession. Now, the great commandment, they're loving the Lord God in all these ways of worship, praising God. Now, the next second half of that, that is to love the Lord your God, but also to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, watch what happens. All the believers were together, having everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And they were, they were selling their stuff. Why? Well, they're all, all hanging out in Jerusalem. Because when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he was on the earth for 40 days, and then he was ascended into heaven, and there were two men in bright, white, shiny apparel that stood there and said, you men of Galilee, why are you standing looking up into heaven? The same Jesus that went into heaven will come again. They think Jesus is coming back any day now. And they started living like it. People who had gathered from all over the world, Jerusalem, for Pentecost, weren't leaving. Well, they were running out of their money. And so in order for them to stick around, brother was helping brother. They gave anyone as he had need. Okay? Here's it. They're loving their neighbor as themselves. And see this, the second part taking place. And they were enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, the third aspect of this is the Great Commission, where Jesus said, go and make disciples. We jumped on the last verse. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right? Baptism was mentioned earlier. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you get baptized to show that you belong to Jesus publicly, and then you become a member of the church where you will grow. And the Lord was adding to their number of the church daily. As I said earlier, 3,000 people were added to the church. I just think this is a great model. This was normal, Jesus-built church life. Does that make sense? This was normal. I want it today. Anybody here want that today? I mean, I really want... I want Bethany to be like the church in Jerusalem. I can't make that happen. I can only yield to Jesus. 
Okay? Jesus will build the church, not me. And I'm not looking for the phenomenal numbers and all of that, but there should be growth. The church should be growing. Because Jesus promised, I will build my church. And if we kind of just step out of the way and say, Lord Jesus, build. It's not going to be what I'm doing. You do it. Do something for me. And we just yield to Him. I think that I think we can see what happened in the book of Acts happened right here in Waterford. I believe that. Okay, I believe that. So, um, all of this is introduction. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm using up all my time. Week one, we're going to talk about the great confession. That Jesus, you are the Christ. I want to cover who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what Jesus has. That's what I want to cover tonight, okay? Next week, I want to talk about the great commandment. To love the Lord your God. That it is, when we talk about love, we're talking about worship as sacrificial. That I, I bring a sacrifice to the Lord. Worship as being self-sacrificial. I bring myself to the Lord. And that the third part is, the believer has a sacrifice himself to offer. I give something back to the Lord. Okay? And, and we're going to find that in, in week two. But the second part of week two is love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to learn that love shows in your serving. How you are serving. Okay? And it shows how you serve one another. We're going to look at 31 different places in the New Testament that tells us to do something to one another. I bet you couldn't think of 31 of them right now. You might think of four or five, but there's a lot of them. All right? And we're going we're gonna to look at those. Week three, we're going to look at go and make disciples. And we're going to start talking about how to start a Christian conversation. Okay, a conversation that brings, it, brings the conversation around to Jesus. And in that conversation, I want to utilize Christian celebrations. Here's what I've learned. The younger generation doesn't accept the Bible as authoritative. But... If we don't start with the Bible, because they'll tune us out right away. If we start with Christian celebrations, we're going to talk about those. We have them. Christmas, Easter, those kinds of things. That we start with a different starting point and then back those up because they see those as authoritative. They've been through that. They experience that. They do that. And so we're going to teach an approach how to share in your conversation the Lord Jesus that they're going to be really comfortable with. It'll be an easier way. And then how to give a Christian invitation. All right. But today... All right, today I want to look at the great confession. It's found in Matthew 16. Jesus said to his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who is the Son of Man? And they replied, Some said John the Baptist, others said Elijah, and so others said Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter says. Blessed are you, Simon, uh, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Something supernatural is taking place when a person comes to genuine recognition of who Jesus is. It doesn't come by themselves. God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God is at work in that person's life. Okay, God is, God is doing that. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. See here? I will build my church. You know, often now people say, you know, come on in. We're going to talk about uh, our church. But this is, come on in. There's a seat over here. Yeah. We're Sorry. Done. And there's another one by Diane. <laughs> she might bite. I'm going to sit by her. All right. This, Bethany is not my church. Bethany is not your church. It's Christ's church. And, and, and it's a simple little thing, but this is the church of Jesus Christ. I don't own it. I don't call the shots. He should be calling the shots. I, I'm a pastor, but he is the, that means I'm the shepherd. But he is the chief shepherd. I'm just the under shepherd. Okay? That's, that's all that I am. It, it's his church. He's in charge. So I want to focus on who he is. The confession is that Jesus is the Christ. And so I want to spend some time now just talking about who Jesus is. Jesus is fully God. He is fully God. In every sense of the word, Jesus is God. This is just basic Bible theology. Here's probably one of the strongest statements in the Bible, but it's so obscure people don't even know it's there. In Romans 9.5 it says, referring to Israel, theirs are the patriarchs. 
From them is traced the human ancestry of Christ. Jesus is man, his human ancestry. Then it says, this Christ, who is God? Isn't that amazing? Jesus is God. That's a really profound, profound statement. Thomas said to him after Jesus resurrected from the dead, and he finally saw him the second week after, you know, it been a week, the second appearance, a week later, uh, he said, calls Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus is God. Jesus doesn't correct him on this. He is God. I look at another place in Hebrews chapter 1. It says, but about the Son, he says, now this is God speaking, your throne, O God, he's saying to the Son, God the Son, will last forever and ever. Even the Father calls Jesus God. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is God. All right. Now, on the other hand, Jesus is fully man. Jesus is fully man. It says when Mary gave birth her, to her first son, her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. She birthed a son. He is genuinely, fully man. Jesus is fully God. He is fully man. It says that in 1 Timothy 2.5, all I'm doing is throwing verses out here just to make this point. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So Jesus is man. As such, he can experience everything that we experience. He got tired. He needed to eat. He had to drink. He matured. He grew up. Okay? He grew up. The question is often asked, did Jesus fall down when he tried to walk as a child? <laughs> hmm, did he do that? Yes! Because he, he's fully man. Human, okay, being human is not sinful. He was perfectly sinless. We'll see that in a few moments. So even though he's sinless, he still had... Every experience that we have apart from being sinful. So he's fully man. Okay, he's fully man. And, and there's other passages, and we're not going through those. No, so Jesus is what theologians call fully the God man. The God man. Now, it's not the man God, because man did not become God, but he is the God man. They call this a theanthropic person in theology books, but it just simply means. He's God, he's man, at the same time. But he's not a third thing. It's not like he's got two natures, a human nature and a divine nature, but they're not put together as one. He's got two distinct natures in one person. We're going to see that in a few moments. He's one person, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, with a human nature, a divine nature. He is fully the God-man. This is a crucial verse in the Bible. And I'm going to encourage you to memorize it or part portion of it. Jesus has a pre-existent name. Before time ever began, he was called the Word. You see it's capitalized, the Word? That's because it's a name. It's a name. Now, do you ever uh, have a flat tire and have to get out and jack your car up with the, the car jack? Well, what if the guy's name is Jack? And he's out there and he's jacking up the car, okay? All right? Because the name, okay, when you would write that would be capitalized, but to say you got the jack out of the trunk would not be capitalized, okay? But it's a, it's a name. Jesus' name, before he was born in the, the, the manger and they named him, his name for eternity was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He had a pre-existent name. His name is literally in Greek, Lagos, which comes over like this into English, Lagos, and which means, if we translate it, it means Word. This is the whole idea of the concept of a Word. Uh, rhema is another Greek word for Word, but means something you speak. Speak. Because I could write a word on a piece of paper, and, and you could read that, but I didn't speak that. This is, what I write is, is an expression of a thought. And there's this really, really profound stuff here. Because God is telling us that Jesus, 
is the expression of the mind of God. Is this great? Jesus. He is God. He's trying to tell us, listen, Jesus is God. So as we look here, he, he has pre-existed to creation. So pick a time for creation. Boom, there's, there's creation. And time just goes on. One day time will have an end as we step into eternity. But time goes on. Before creation, before Genesis 1-1. You can put Genesis 1-1 at that time. Before that, it was the very beginning. In the beginning, we got the word was. The word, the logos already was. It's imperfect tense in Greek, which means he had a continuous, continuous existence prior to the beginning. Jesus was forever and ever and ever before that because he is God, right? So he's pre-existed to creation. The next thing, he had a pre-existent relationship. The word was with God. Now, the word with in, in the Greek language is pros. And the word for face, my face, is prosopon. Prosopon means face. And they just shortened that to say with. They took the name face and shortened it to pros to say I'm with that person face to face. We're, we're talking about, you say, oh, I can, I'm with you on that. And I could be over the phone. Hey, I'm with you on that. But that's not pros, that, that's not pros because you're not there face to face with them. But when he says, I am, and he was with God beings for all eternity, there's a face-to-face -face relationship between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because he, what the Word was, with God, and he was with God. And so we got this face-to-face -face relationship. He goes on, he says, and the Word was God. He's pre-existing deity. He is God. And uh, that is the part I really want you to memorize. You really need to know this. Have that in your bank, John 1.1. 1, 1. And the word was God. Because Jesus is God. He was in the beginning. Now, through him, all things were made. How many things? Did you ever tell somebody Jesus made you? That's, act, I, that's sound theology. Yeah. Jesus. The Father. You see, my, my scheme of how it worked out, the Father planned in, in an econ, in economic way it was going to happen. The Father planned, the Son created, the Holy Spirit energized, as in, verse, in Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and the earth was well formed and void, and darkness was on the face of the, face of the deep, and the Spirit brooded over the. He energized, he, he does something there. All three are part of creation, but this text tells me that my being me is a direct result of the creative work of Jesus Christ. My Savior, my God. Your Savior, your God, made you to be who you are. And everything, everything, He made it all. Look, without Him, nothing was made that has been made. So would that include the angels? Yeah, that includes the angels. You name it. If, it. if it exists, He made it. He is God. Is this powerful stuff? This is who we worship. This is who we worship. Jesus is fully the God man in an incarnate body. I'm jumping down some verses now. From John 1, 1 and 2, all the way down to verse 14. John in the first chapter doesn't give up on talking about the Word. The pre-existent God. And he says, and the Word became flesh. The Lagos, is what he says, took on a body. That's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about the fact that God became flesh. My God came to earth. Uh, a pastor was dealing with a bunch of, uh, I think they were Muslims or Buddhists. Uh, I think it was in Pakistan or somewhere. And, uh, and they were all telling how, how, how they thought you get to heaven. And he finally let them all tell their part. And then he said to them, he says, so if I understand what you're saying, you're saying all of you see God at the top of a mountain. And you're all taking a different path to get to God, but it's all the same one God. They said, yeah, yeah, we're all on a different path, but we all get to the same place. He said, well, let me tell you, you don't have to do that. Because God came down off the mountain became one of us. <laughs> You see what's going on here? God 
became flesh. God became, became, became flesh. Now, I like the next part. And he made his dwelling among us. The word for dwelling is that he tabernacled or he tented. In the Old Testament, there was the tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle a a that was set up? God would come down and, and he would manifest himself in what they called a Shekinah glory, a great effulgence of brilliant light where God would be inside the tabernacle. What the passage is saying is, I gave you the whole tabernacle theme so that you would know when I got here that in the body of Jesus Christ, whether a babe or a man, God was in him. God was in Jesus. And uh, this is just so powerful. He made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. Remember the Old Testament said that the glory cloud would be manifest itself above uh, where, where the Ark of the Covenant was in the, the holy place? And it would turn into a pillar of fire by night. The glory of the Lord all right, was, was in Jesus. We have seen his glory. Now, I, I think this is why some artists, when they draw Jesus, put halos around him, you know. They make him glow. Now, I don't think Jesus really glowed, but what he's saying, there is a glory in Jesus that if you've got a spiritual eye, you see that glory. You know that this is God who has come in the flesh. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is what we got going on. He says he is the one and only. He is the unique incarnate God. All right. There's not another one like him. The word here in the Greek is monogenes. Genes means to be born. Mono means first. Firstborn or only born. And uh, he is the, remember King James? The only begotten son, right? That's the term here, only begotten. He's the only begotten. Well, people have stumbled over that. If you're begotten, you must have a time. And if you're uh, the only begotten, they've stumbled over that. But the term really means to be unique. All right? Now, Abraham had two sons, right? Remember Abraham? Who were his two sons? Ishmael and Isaac. Who was born first, Ishmael or Isaac? Ishmael. Ishmael. Do you know in Hebrews chapter 11, it calls not Ishmael, but Isaac, his only begotten son. So there's something, because he wasn't the, he wasn't the only one. He had another son. And he wasn't even the firstborn. So how could he be the only begotten son? It's because he was uniquely, he was the only one begotten according to the promise of God. He was unique. It has nothing to do with time, aspect, the order. It has everything to do with there's not another one like him. So later Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way. He's the only way. And he came from the Father full of grace and truth. Wow. In Colossians it says, For in Christ the fullness of deity lives in a bodily form. There's a bunch of other places. The point I'm trying to make here is just simply this. Jesus is fully the God man. And there's all kinds of verses that show his pre-existence. -pre in John chapter 8 it says, Jesus is speaking to, to the, I believe it's the Pharisees, he says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, here's the birth of Abraham. We'll put him at 2500 B.C. That's where I usually place him on, 2500 B.C. And uh, Abraham was born at that time. Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, I am is a name for, for, for Jehovah. When, they, when Moses said to God, who am I going to tell the people you are? He said, tell them... I am has sent you. My name is I am. The Jews knew that he was saying that he was not only, and they said, well, you're not, even old. you're not even 50 years old yet. How could you say before Abraham? Because Jesus is saying, I am preexistent. I am God. And, and so it shows, it shows in his names. He's called God, the Son of God, the, the one and only, uh, the Lord. It shows up in all of his characteristics. I've got these listed for you. He's eternal. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere present. He is unchanging. Jesus is, is God. It shows up in His divinity, in His works. He creates. He upholds. He raises the dead. He forgives sin. They're, these are all in your notes. It shows up in His glory. He prays in the upper room. He says, Now, Father, glorify me in Your presence with the glory I had with You before the world began. 
He had a glory before time. He's saying, now it's time to glorify me again. He's going to go to the cross and die. And God is going to glorify him with a resurrected, glorified body. All right? He says, glorify me. All right. I didn't make any discussion questions because I knew I had a lot of stuff here today. But instead, I made some assignments. <laughs> All right? And you got me already there. You can see. I want you to memorize who Jesus is. I want you to say, if somebody says, who is Jesus? He is the God-man. That's an easy, easy assignment, right? We're going to test you next week. All right. Here's a verse I'd like you to memorize. Go with that. All right. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Some of you say, oh, I'm a terrible memorizer. At least memorize the red print. <laughs> All right? And the Word was with God. Or the Word was God. And the Word was God. And just memorize that. And then in John 14, I want you to memorize, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. This is crucial. This is foundational. And especially as later we'll try to share our faith with someone. We've got a bedrock. It's in the same chapter, okay, one chapter, declaring He is God, He is the God-man. And, and you can express this, and, and, and I'll show you a, a simple way to show your faith, okay? And that's the assignment, right? Uh, normally I take a little break. If you need to use restroom or anything, you better hurry. Because <laughs> break time is now over. All right. <laughs> All right. I want to focus not only on who he is. He is the God man. I want to focus on what he did. This is really important. What Jesus did. Now when you think of what Jesus did, first thing we will probably think of is he died on the cross. All right. But there's two concepts I want to get. He obeyed completely. That's what he did. Look at this verse. In the book of Hebrews. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, the Old Testament. I have come to do your will, O God. Jesus was obedient. Theologians put it in two ways. They say he had an active obedience and a passive obedience. Active obedience means he did everything right to fulfill the law. He is the only one who never broke the Ten Commandments. In fact, he's the only one who never broke the 613 commandments in the Torah. All right? So that was his active obedience. He had to obey all of that to be a qualified Savior. Because if he had violated any of the commandments, he could not be your Savior. Because he would need salvation too. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, all right. He came to, to, to obey. So, first thing I want to point out is he lived a sinless life. Anybody here ever throw darts? Alright? Probably most of you did at some point. Anybody here got a bullseye every time? No hands went up. <laughs> no hands went up. The word for sin is to miss the goal, the target. Okay? And so Jesus hit the bullseye. In fact, if I were to do this right, I'd be stacking every one of those right on the end of the other one. Because he did it so perfectly, he hit the bullseye every single time his whole life. I would not have wanted to be Jesus' brother. <laughs> How come you can't be like Jesus? I guess because I'm a sinner and he's not. <laughs> All right. He lived a sinless life. In fact, the Bible says... In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he knew no sin. He wasn't even acquainted with a sinful action. Okay? He knew no sin. For he, it says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. There's another place that says in 1 Peter, he committed no sin. It's not simply that you know, I commit a lot of sins. I mean, I have an evil thought, the guy cuts me off, I want to yell at him, scream, and you know, all that kind of thing. And, and Jesus never had those, th those impulses. He, he never did any of that. He never committed a sin. There was no sin in him. He was not born with a sinful nature. 
How could that be? Anybody want to suggest how it could be that he didn't, wasn't born with a sinful nature? We all have a sinful nature. We're all descendants from Adam. Adam sinned, so it was passed on to every one of us. So how was it that he had no sinful nature? Pardon? It was God. It was God. God man. It was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so the sinful nature was not passed on to him. And so it says, in fact, it said the Holy Spirit would overpower her so that within her womb would be conceived a holy thing. A holy thing. A holy human nature to which the divine person, the Lagos, would be united. And so the person was divine. Well, the, 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 Jesus' person was divine while his body was human, his nature was human, and he had a, a divine nature. This is so confusing, isn't it? Yes. Wow. It wasn't like Jesus had a human person. Because there wasn't divine Jesus speaking to human Jesus, hey, what should we do? I don't know. What are you guys going to do today? <laughs> He's not schizophrenic. But the divine Lagos, the person, the second person of the eternal trinity, took on a human nature, and that human nature was protected by the Holy Spirit so that it was holy in an absolute way. So there was no, no sin in him. No sin in him. Jesus is a lot different from me. I was born a sinner. She's a lot different from you. You're born a sinner. Jesus was different because the Holy Spirit protected him so that he could become a qualified, suitable Savior to take our place. Okay? He lived a sinless life without defect. He was Christ, a lamb without a blemish or defect. There were no flaws whatsoever in him. He was without sin. We have, <clears throat> have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Because he's human, every temptation that bombards you was bombarded to him. But he was without sin. The divine person always said, no. No. They call that the impeccability of Christ, that he could not have fallen or sinned because he was protected by being born through the virgin birth and also by the fact that he is God. And so, was it still possible to tempt him? And it's human, of course. It would be like me, okay, going out against, what's our biggest ship in the Navy right now? The mighty Mo. Is that what it is? The mighty Missouri. Okay, going out against our biggest battleship, biggest whatever it is, and I'm out there in a rowboat. No. <laughs> okay? And I take a pea shooter. Now I'm going to engage in war. <laughs> All right? I, I'm tempting him to fight me. Is he going to fight me? He, there, there, there's no temptation. He doesn't give in to that temptation because he's all powerful. He's God. Come in the flesh. He's sinless. And this is what's so wonderful about the fact that we have Jesus as our Savior. Since he was tempted at all points, just as we are yet without sin, so he is able, I, he's my high priest, I can go to him with all my problems. Because he knows what it is like to be tempted, but he knows what it's like to never give in. I've noticed this about temptation. When I give in, it's gone. <laughs> For about 15 minutes. And it'll rise itself again, right? The longer I hold off, the worse the temptation becomes, the more I really, really want to do it. Okay? And so, he never gave in. Never gave in. Amazing. Okay. So what did he do? He died for our sins. I call this salvation. If I were to say, what, what is salvation? Uh, I'm, some of you jump out with some answers to that. I like to call salvation the most general term. It's an overarching term that covers everything that God does in saving us. From choosing us before time, in Ephesians chapter 1, we are chosen in Christ, okay? Being predestinated, being adopted. It has to do with redemption. It has to, everything falls under the umbrella. Whatever it takes for God to rescue me from my sin comes under the umbrella of salvation. It's a big term, okay? Big term. So, he died for our sins, but God demonstrated his love towards us. Oh, I love this. God loved me so much. He demonstrated it that while we were still sinners, while I was... I was a horrible person. The whole idea, I'm going to get myself better for God, just doesn't work. 
While I was still a sinner, Christ died for us. The for us. He did that out of love to save me. When he died, several things took place. He paid my debt. He paid my debt. That is called redemption. Redemption. Some of you are in the book club, and there's a whole chapter on redemption uh, in the story of Ruth, because Ruth is a book about redemption. Boaz was, uh, you know, the redeemer who redeemed uh, uh, Ruth uh, from, you know, uh, her debts, okay? And so that's all I get. The price that needs to be paid is death. You see, for the wages of sin, which we all have, we all missed the mark. Throw in the, the darts, we missed. For the wages of sin is death. But the price had to be paid in order to get us out of the slave market of our sin, to save us, to deliver and rescue us. The price had to be paid, and Jesus paid the price. I want to ask any of you who are familiar with what that is. <laughs> Anybody here? Somebody who doesn't know what that is? That's an S and H green staff, all right? S and H green staff. Anybody uh, ever have any of those? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody ever have like a book of those? Yeah. A whole book. Anybody ever gone to an S and H uh, Green Stamp Redemption Center? Yeah. <laughs> redemption. Oh, there's my word, redemption, right? And, and what you did is, what back in the day, you'd buy something and they would give you green stamps to go with it. It could be your gas, could be groceries, anything, but they give you green stamps. My mom would not shop at a place if they weren't giving green stamps. Like, like, how many had the catalog? The catalog of you know, what you could buy. But three, three thousand books you could get. Three thousand books? Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, if you had a book, you had a lot, all right? And so, but you would take your green stamps, stick them in the book. When you got the books all done, you go to the redemption center, and there they'd have all the stuff. They wouldn't take money. Money was not the medium of exchange. Green stamps were the medium of exchange. You can only buy with those green stamps. And that's what redemption's about. It's about buying, but the medium of exchange is not money. It's not green stamps. The medium of exchange is blood. In him we have redemption through his blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, the book of Leviticus says. And it said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's why this text says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The, the soul that sins shall surely die. It's all of us, we've all sinned. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God said, if you want the payment, you must die. You've got to shed your blood, you've got to die. And so Jesus, on the cross, wears the thorns. Blood's trickling down. Got the nails in his hands. Blood's trickling down. On his feet, going down. In his side, blood's going down. He is killed on the cross. He's murdered. He, he, but he has no sin. That's because he is paying our debt. My debt put to Jesus. He's paying the price. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is this. You break any of the commandments, you die. That's it. James said, if you offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. Because the law stands. The whole thing stands together as God's will. And if you break any one little piece of it, you've broken the will of God. All right? It's like you're, you've got a big picture window. And you know, you're outside as a kid, you're playing ball, you hit your rubber ball, but your ball, rubber ball is a little hard enough that it hits the window just at the right place and it cracks it down in the corner. Tell me, is the window broken? Is the whole window broken? The whole window is broken. But I only did this one little thing over here. But it broke the whole window. It's not that you're all, the whole thing is shattered. But the whole thing is broken, and that's the way people are. Our whole lives are broken because of sin. And so he has to redeem us from the curse of the law. That if you offend in one point, ever, one time in your life, told a little white lie, you've broken the whole law. But Jesus never did that. Okay? And so the, the, he paid the debt that we could not pay. Now, 
he also, and that was redemption. He paid the price, but he did so as a substitute. He took my place. Christ redeemed us. There's my word. He, he paid the price from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's why God became man. He's the sinless man. Now he's qualified to take your place. If he had sin of his own, he couldn't take your place. He has to die for his own. But because he is sinless, and because he is infinite in his being, he is able to pay our debt on the cross in a matter of a few hours. Because an eternal person paid your and my eternal debt to an infinite degree because of who he is. Isn't this amazing? We have the solution to the whole world's sin, curse problem. And it's right here, all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Redeemed us from the curse of the law. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God put it right on him. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God took his righteousness and he put it to me the day I accepted Jesus as my Savior. My sin was charged to his account. He died. His life was charged to my account the day I believed in Jesus. I was eight years old. I didn't even know that that happened. All I know is I, I was afraid that if I died, I realized that I was a sinner. If I die, I'm going to go to hell. That is not a good prospect. <laughs> so I accept Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. Okay? And, and, but I didn't know. I got I got God's righteousness. And so that when God looks down, He sees Dennis not as a condemned sinner, but as a saved sinner. I'm still a sinner, but I've been saved by the grace of God. And I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. He sees what Jesus has done, and He says, oh, all that sin, He paid for it. It's all paid for. It's all paid for. All paid for. He was my substitute. For Christ died for sin once for all. He only had to die one time because he's an infinite person. The righteous for the unrighteous. He was the righteous, I'm the unrighteous. So that he might bring me to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Holy Spirit. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I love that verse. That's another one you need to memorize. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Third thing that he redeemed us, he was my substitute. He satisfied God's justice. This is called propitiation. That's a mouthful. We don't use that word very often. It only occurs in the Bible a few places, but it's a really important term. The word propitiation is used in the book of Hebrews for the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark was that box that was inside the tabernacle in the most holy chamber, and it was made out of, out of gold. The lid was of solid gold, and it had two cherubim over the top, wings that arched over, all beaten out of one piece of gold, and, and it was there that God would come down, the Shekinah glory of effulgence would rest, directly above that, outside the, the tabernacle, would be the glory cloud that would go up, and, and God was there. This lid, okay, was a lid on a box. Inside the box were the Ten Commandments, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Those things. The Ten Commandments. I want to focus on that for a moment. Inside the box is the law of God, the will of God, that we have broken. All of us. We're all sinners. This lid, in Hebrews, is called the place of propitiation. It's called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Once a year, the high priest would go in, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat to make the propitiation, called an atonement. Make an atonement, propitiation. Propitiation a little stronger than atonement. The word atonement means at one met, to bring at one, okay? Propitiation has to do with satisfying the outraged holiness and justice of God. The soul that sins must surely die. He would sprinkle blood on there because inside was the law that the people had broken and God would look down and see the blood and he would, he would cover, that, that blood would cover their sins for one year. Then they do it again the next year. Then they do it the next year. But the book of Hebrews said the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But what did we just read in John? The Lamb of God took away the sin of the world. This whole idea here is that Jesus' death 
satisfied the outraged holiness of God that is saying that Jesus' payment was sufficient for our sins. What if Jesus had died for our sins and it wasn't sufficient? We'd all still be a big mess. <laughs> but because of propitiation, it satisfied God's outraged holiness. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. One Greek word, tetelestai. It's perfect tense, which means it happened one time and it stands forever. It also means, the word tetelestai means paid in full. The debt was entirely paid. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. He made propitiation. Then, he arose from the dead. That's what he did. Jesus had predicted it in John 10. I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it up from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up. God had given him the authority to go to the cross and die for us. And given him the authority to come back to life again. Now in Romans chapter 4 verse 25, it, it tells us that uh, he, he gave up his life for us and that he was raised on account of our justification. It's almost as though it says, if he had not fully accomplished paying in the full the price of all that we owed, he would not have been raised from the dead. So being raised from the dead is the evidence that God accepted the full payment for our sins. Is this amazing stuff? This is amazing stuff. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. This is resurrection life. This is eternal life. That's what He has. He has eternal life. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the whole message of Easter. All right, here's what He did. And here's my assignment. All right? I don't have discussion much because I know I'm going to run out of time. I'm watching the clock. <laughs> this is what we need to memorize. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These are just a few. If you can't memorize it all, He takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> you got to have that concept down. I, everything I've been talking about here is who he is. He's the God man, okay? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. What did he do? He's the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that's a. I'm getting the gospel down in the tiniest nutshells I think that we can and encompass, you know, what, what it is here. All right, the last, the last area that we're going to go to. Anybody need a break? You want to stand up, stretch? <laughs> You guys are good students. All right, here we go. Let's focus on what he made, what he has. Jesus has eternal life. He has it. The verse that we read earlier, for the wages of sin is death. But the second part of the verse is, but the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life. The part I like in this verse is the one I didn't highlight. It's the little word in. In. I do this with kids. I'll take a Bible. Let's see if I can it. Take a Bible. And I take Oh, it's five dollar bill. Put five dollar going. Well, that's even more tight. <laughs> and I put it in there. You know what? Every time I do this, I forget to take it out. And then later I find, oh I got money in my Bible. <laughs> Where's the money? In the Bible. So in order to get the money, what do you got to do? You got to I'm gonna I'm gonna offer you this five dollar bill, okay? What do you got to do to get to it? You got to take what? The Bible. Because the money's inside the Bible. You cannot get eternal life. Eternal life is, see, the five dollars represents eternal life. The Bible represents Jesus. You can't get eternal life without taking Jesus Christ. Because eternal life is inside Him. And so if you want to have, see this time I remember my five dollar bill. Inside him, in Jesus is eternal life. That's what the text says. The gift of God is eternal life in 
Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in the Greek text, same way. It's the word in Jesus Christ. It is. You've got to have him in order to have eternal life. That's what he has. Now, with the gift, this gift of eternal life, there comes some other things, all right? One of the things I like to talk about is he has abundant life. Not just eternal life. Immediately you think about, okay, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven and be with God forever, right? And uh, that someday, I'm going to, uh, you know, after this life, I'm going to live in an afterlife forever and ever. But he said, he's come not just for the future. He's come for the present. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. So I got this cup over here just overflowing, overflowing. Jesus wants to bless us so much that we can't contain it. You know what the obstacle is? Me. Oh, me of little faith. Oh, me of such great doubt. Oh, me, I'll do it my way, not your way, Lord. Right? <laughs> I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. When? Right now. I like the way the English Standard Version puts it. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. God wants you to have the best life. The only thing standing between me and the best life is me. He also, what he did is he has, what he has is he has forgiveness. You read in the Gospels where Jesus would forgive them and then the Pharisees said, oh, how can this man forgive? Because only God could forgive. Well, guess what? Jesus is God. He says, so he said, what's easier for me to do? Heal the man or forgive his sins? Because he said, oh, your sins be forgiven you. And so he said, hey, take up your bed and walk. And then he gets up and walks away. Proving, well, okay, if I did that, then... See, that's what a, miracles were. They were a sign that pointed to Jesus as to who he was. And so when he did that, okay, here's what I got. Forgiveness. Well, I wanted to find forgiveness. The word forgiveness is apoluo in the Greek New Testament. And it's built upon the word luo. The word luo means to let go. So I got this guy here. <laughs> he let go. Did you see that? All right. He, he let go. Let me go. In case you weren't watching. The word means let go. <laughs> right. But here's the deal. This is this this rope that, that is hanging on to. Um, I'm going to put it at a human level, not just the, the divine level, but a human level. But let's say my wife does something that truly offends me, okay? And, and I get all upset with her, and I'm angry with her, and I know she's wrong. <laughs> okay. she's done something wrong and it's really offended me she's now got an obligation to satisfy my justice right I'm angry and so I recall that guilt she's the guilty party she's done something that offended me all right that, that's what it was it's called guilt now sometimes it's imagined guilt false guilt but sometimes it's real guilt we do things that offend other people I, come on we're, I'm a sinner I do that and so um, so she, she has offended, let's say she has offended me. Now she's, she's guilty of that. And I, I'm hanging on to her guiltiness. And I, I, I'm, I'm not talking to her. I'm protesting. I'm being passive aggressive. I, you know, I'm hanging on to that because I mean, I'm holding on to, you know, she's going on with life as normal. She doesn't know any of that. You know, she's, she's kind of ignoring me. Why are you not talking to that? I don't know what's wrong with her. So, but I'm hanging on to this guilt. It doesn't bother her one bit. Right? It doesn't bother her one bit. But I'm hanging on to this guilt. Forgiveness is the point where I just. Let go of the guilt. Let me back up for a second. When I sin against God, when I sin against God, guilt is associated with me. I am guilty to satisfy the judgment of God. I'm guilty. The soul that sins shall surely die. I have guilt. Here's the guilty. I'm, there's my guilt. When God forgives us, God lets go of that guilt. But where does it go? Folks, it went to the cross. Jesus paid the price on the cross. So that my sin was put to his account and he forgives me. He lets go of that. Have, have you ever, you know, uh, 
got on your knees and prayed. You're praying to the Lord. You say, God, I blew it again. Here I am asking for your forgiveness again. And he says, what do you mean again? You see, he let go. The only one hanging on is us. We're beating ourselves to death because when he forgives, he genuinely really lets go. He doesn't forget. He knows exactly where he put it. He put it on the Son, Jesus. He paid in full our debt. He has forgiveness. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And that's the story I was telling. And he said, Whoa, how can he say your, your sins are forgiven? He said, What's easier? Get up and walk, okay? He let go. He said, Hey, your sins are forgiven. He let go. All right? All the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him, that is in Jesus, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He let go of my sins. The day I believed in him, whoosh, oh, my sins were gone. God is not hanging on to the. You see, contrary to most people believe that God is out to get you, he's not. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to save the world. He didn't come into the world to hang on to all your crud. He came to forgive it. Let it go. we got to get past it. we got to just believe that He's done that and live for Him. Listen, forgiveness. He's also given to us peace. This is what He has. He has peace. I, I love this. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. The world, we talked about this a few, a few Sundays back when we were talking about on the fruit of the Spirit's peace. The world's peace is just that less war. It's not real peace. Jesus, I don't give it like the world gives. I give genuine peace in your soul. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as your Savior, I love those moments. I mean, there's some that are just stamped in my mind. There's a friend of mine, his name is Russell Slade. He calls me every now and then. I got home back. He's recently called me. At least, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, he, he was my neighbor, and he came to church uh, for a men's prayer breakfast, and he accepted Jesus, and the day he accepted Jesus in my office, I don't know, I thought I had charismatic on my hands. He got done praying and accepting Christ as a Savior. He jumped up and down, oh, whoa! I mean, he, I thought, what is going on here, man? And he said, I am forgiven, I'm forgiven. Anytime I talk to him, he's not lost his joy one bit. I'm envious because I go up and down. He is always just up. He's always just up. Okay? He's got a peace that all the crud in his life was gone. And he says, you know, I don't want to ever go back to that. Again. He, he's talking about, uh, he does, he, he, he leads us. The church that I pastored at that time, he's now on staff. Is that cool or what? Is that cool or what? I, I just think it's great. Bible says, for he himself is our peace. Listen, you cannot have peace, real peace, genuine peace. Peace with God, the peace of God. You can't have it without having a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, we have peace with God. Now, you see, one time God was upset with me. I was under the wrath of God. How do I know that? John 3, 36 says, he that has the Son has life. And he that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Wow. The day I accepted Jesus Christ, I had peace with God. Why? My sin was taken away, put on the cross. I'm not at peace with God. But he says, and the peace of God. Now, the peace of God is different than the peace with God. Peace with God just means God is not angry with me. The peace of God is what God puts in my heart when I'm in all turmoils. There's all things going on in my world that are turning it upside down, agitating, frustrating. And all of a sudden, I pray, and it says, when I pray to him, he'll give me... And the peace of God that transcends all understanding. It's mind-blowing. That kind of peace of God will guard your heart. The guard is like it sets up a garrison of Roman soldiers around your heart. God placed all these Roman soldiers there to protect your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Because my mind tends to whirl and whirl. It's like a broken record. Uh, uh, you know, some of you aren't acquainted with records anymore. But records. Remember the old days you had a record? And you'd have the skip in it. Somebody scratch the record. And they would want to go around like, I want to hold you. I want to hold you. I want to hold you. you know? and, and, and so, you know, that's the way my mind works. When something, you know, when, when I am, when I am um, depressed, when I'm down, I'm blue, you know, I play that same broken record over and over. It says here, 
But if you just pray and hand it over to God, that's the text before this, huh? you pray the peace of God, God's peace, it'll blow your mind, it'll guide your heart, it'll guard your mind. It'll fix that broken record. You pray it once, say, oh, when it comes back around, you know, that second time around, you say, wait, I already gave that to God. And this is what I do. I say, God, you got a problem. <laughs> you know, because I gave that to you and it's coming back to me. you got a problem. You better fix that. I don't take ownership of it because he's, I give it to him. Let, let him take care of it. What he has, he has freedom. Freedom. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I got the chains being broken here. Isn't there a song like Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone? Something like that? Yeah. That's a great song. You know, because we were all one time we were chained to our old sinful nature's habits. Some of them are really hard to break. Did you ever notice that? We, we have trained ourselves in certain habits for so many years. It's kind of like when we were kids, we had a pool table. And... Uh, we were kids, so it wasn't the best pool table. My, my parents were smart enough, but uh, we would take our the ball would be close, and I'd want my ball to hit it. I take my stick and I drag it across the, you know, the, the felt top, <laughs> kind of make a little groove. I gently hit my ball, and it would roll, bump the ball, and we go in. Well, hey, after a while, there were so many grooves in the table because my brothers would do this too. You, did, you, know, you only had to come close to the pocket. You only had to come. You hit one of those grooves. Whoop! It would go in. Whoop! Yeah. That's where our lives are. We've been doing the same thing over and over and over. And so I get up this morning, I go out there, and, and, and I'm chained to this habit. And I go and I do the exact same thing over again. At the end of the day, i got to pray and say, God, forgive me, I blew my, blew my life. Why? Because I am enslaved. Some chains, some, sometimes all the chains are broken. Sometimes there's one or two that lingers on, and man, I fight like somebody here got you know a, a chain, you know that, that big gizmo that you use. You you cut the chain. I need them. I need them broken. But if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. You'll be a free free indeed. I love this verse, Galatians five one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. God wants you to be free. Free from all your guilt, free from all your worry. He wants you to be He wants you to be free. I have all that in Him. That's what He has, freedom. He set us free. All right, so my final assignment here, because I'm ending really well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, what does Jesus have? He's got eternal life. You might put next to that resurrection life. As we're going to see later, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live, and he that believes in me. Right, I got messed up the verse, but he, he has, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection is taking something that's dead and making it alive. And I don't care how messed up bad life may be. He can make something great out of it. He can bring it from death to life. And he, he is that. There, there's so much involved in there. I've had some key little words along the side. Christmas, Good Friday, Easter. Those are Christian celebrations. We're going to talk about those. Uh, actually, I think i got another slide here. Put this down a little bit. Um, I am going somewhere with all of this that I'm telling and sharing. This was really important tonight. We basically covered theology. It was a survey of the theology. It's called Christology, who Christ is, what he did, and what he has. And that sums it up pretty well. Um, this is like what we call systematic theology. Because I'm just taking proof texts from everywhere to show these points in the Bible, to, to nail it down. I'm going somewhere with all of this, and if you'll memorize those few verses, I don't care if you do the short version, long version, however you do it, it will all come together all right, in uh, two weeks. All right? But until then, next time, we're going to focus on the Great Commandment. We both focus today on, you know, the great confession, who Christ is. He's the God-man, what he did, okay? And then we talked about what he has. He died for my sins, and that he has eternal life. What you got to you know, sir. Next week, we'll talk about the great commandment, to love the Lord your God, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to focus probably more on lo loving the Lord your God. 
because I believe that's what worship is about. And so we'll be talking about how I worship and the ways I can worship God to show that I love Him. And because because He loves everyone, He wants me to love everybody too. And so this whole theme of love, we're going to talk about that next time. And then we'll look at the Great great Commission. Does that make sense? Now, this is just the, the first of these. I'm hoping to do three of these. Uh, we'll do one in Jan uh, in fe February. We'll do three more weeks. And I'll just tell you right now, what we want to do in the, the February one is uh, we're going to do a survey of the life of Christ in chronological order. Uh, we're also going to do, at that time, a survey of the Sermon on the Mount. And then we will do a survey of the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Okay? As we will we'll do that. And then the one in April, I think that's what I got scheduled for, Jesus said, you know, what he did, he died, okay, he rose from the grave. The story didn't end there. He ascended into heaven and he said he's coming back. So we'll do a survey of the second coming of Christ, okay? And then we'll do a, uh, I forgot the next one. I kind of lost my mind, but that's long term. We'll learn more about that. But that's, this, this is an overview of that cyclical pattern. The great confession, right? The great commandment and the great commission to the Great Confession, the Great Commandment, the Great Commission. And, and we're going to go through that, just going a little deeper every time we're through, trying not to repeat it, but to say, whoa, there is so much here. At the end of the Gospel of John, it says, there's no libraries. The world's not big enough to contain all the books that could be written about Jesus. So this is just a survey of Christology tonight. Any questions? Any questions? I know this was a lecture all the way. I'm sorry. Um, would you please give us all those samples? Oh, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll fill those in for you. Yes. I got a master copy somewhere. I didn't bring it here. Yes. Talk about that rope. Doesn't God get tired and frustrated with us always having to ask for forgiveness and then we go right back into doing the exact same thing and then we have to ask for forgiveness again? Well, so is that just the man part? I, I think. <laughs> no, I don't mean man or female. I mean like the, the human part versus the. Do you remember where they went to the, 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 the disciples went to Jesus and said, "Well, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times." Seven times. Seven, seven times. Okay. Now seven in their mind was a large number. Okay. And he said, uh, more like. 70 times 7. And one commentator that I read, I put something very interesting in, in there. He said, I think he meant for the same thing on the same day. Yeah. Wow. Because God, that's the whole point. God. You cannot wear out God. You can't wear him out. You can't. He's infinite. He, he, he is, his existence is so much different than ours. He never grows tired or weary. I think it's one of the prophets says that. He never grows weary or tired. There's a verse in Isaiah that says, Is the Lord's arm shortened that he cannot save? Is his ear plugged that he cannot hear? And the answer is, no. 